so much. Lovely introduction. And uh, thanks very much for the invitation to come here. Um, it's, it's a real pleasure. And, and it's very nice to come back to Dublin uh, for this. I should just say that these, are, uh, these remarks, are, I'm currently, I suppose, unemployed at the moment. I haven't started working for Oxfam yet. And I no longer work for Chatham House. So uh, these are my own personal uh, remarks. And they don't represent either of those uh, institutions. Although, hopefully, I, I wouldn't say anything different when I am employed. But uh, uh, for the record. I mean, piracy is, uh, as Nora was talking about, a, a global problem. This is a problem most prominent at the moment in Somalia. But obviously, we also see problems of piracy off the west coast of Africa, particularly uh, in the Niger Delta in Nigeria. Uh, we've seen problems of piracy in the South China Seas, uh, in the straits between uh, Indonesia and Malaysia, in the Malacca Straits. But, but Somalia really has... Uh, uh, presented a particular mix of circumstances which makes it the, the growth area for piracy. Those circumstances include a, a lack of functioning central government, um, great poverty, so, so there's something I'll talk about a little bit later, the risk reward uh, ratio uh, for young Somali men uh, for getting involved in piracy is very high. Um, and then secondly, actually, Somalia is, is very nicely positioned uh, for acts of piracy. If you look at uh, the map there, of course, passing through the Gulf of Aden, uh, you see a very large proportion of Europe's uh, oil imports uh, from the Persian Gulf have to go through that area. Um, but actually, even further afield now that pirates operate right across uh, the Western Indian Ocean, right up almost to the coast of India, uh, any trade, really, that you want that needs to go uh, to uh, the Persian Gulf, uh, that needs to come into East Africa, uh, that needs to leave from India, even that comes from China, uh, and from the Far East to Europe that needs to use the Suez Canal is going to go through an area which is reachable by people from Somalia in small boats. So it's very well positioned for this. And really, uh, those circumstances uh, have come together and we've seen a real explosion in piracy off the coast of Somalia. If you go back to sort of 2006, 2005, there was a problem of piracy off the coast of Somalia. Something in the region of five to ten ships were attacked a year. Uh, often ships that were very close to the Somali coast, within about 20 or 50 miles of the Somali coast. Um, but then something happened in 2007, 2008. And in a way, I think this was a, a learning by doing, if you like. Uh, pirates had been making tens, twenties of thousands of dollars uh, for the charge of releasing ships. And gradually they were learning, actually, they could push this higher and higher. And in 2007, uh, 2008, you start to see the beginning of very large ransom payments, the beginning of payments in the region of 200,000, 300,000, half a million dollars. And then it goes from what was essentially a cottage industry, criminal industry, but a cottage one, uh, to a very much uh, more substantial concern, and also becomes a much greater concern then uh, for governments uh, in East Africa, governments uh, in the West, in Europe, and uh, in Asia as well. So if we just look at the, the current situation, um, and th then I will go in, and I've been asked to talk about the international response to piracy, uh, and particularly problems with that. But I think I'll just set some of the, uh, the background for that before we go into that, and hopefully then uh, that will be, be illustrate my, my later points quite nicely. If you look at the, 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 the statistics for the last year, for 2011, and I should say that the statistics on Somalia generally uh, and that includes on, on piracy, are pretty uh, poor. Uh, we don't have a very good idea uh, of exactly what's going on. But these are, are indicative and, I think, relatively accurate, given uh, the, the kind of information that we have. The, uh, you can broadly divide uh, pirate attacks, although these all come from Somalia, but you can broadly divide them into three areas. One is the, the Gulf of Aden, so the, the straits or the, the space between the northern coast of Somalia uh, and the southern coast of Yemen. This year, or sorry, the last year, in 2011, there was only one successful capture uh, of a ship in the Gulf of Aden. That's down from about 12 in the previous year. So that is looking like something of a success for the international response or a problem for the pirates. What they call the Somali Basin, which is the sort of left-hand side of the Indian Ocean off the coast of Somalia, four captures. Uh, down from 26 captures the previous year, and 52 failed attacks, down from 68. So again, a, a downward trajectory there. But actually, this masks, this story of success close to Somalia masks the bigger picture, and that is that pirates who have a very adaptable 
uh, business model, if you like. They have very little regard for risk, um, as I'll talk about again in a minute. They've been able to change the range uh, that they operate in. And now we see, oh, or certainly in 2011, and I'm sure it will be different again in 2012, but the, the most number of attacks were up in the Arabian Sea, up towards the entrance to the Persian Gulf. And that was 19 successful captures there and 48 attempts. And that's from a, a level of almost zero uh, in both categories in the previous year. And this really represents the dilemma for dealing with piracy uh, from a naval perspective, is that this is not a fixed uh, operation. Pirates are highly adaptable and they're very able to move uh, around this vast expanse of ocean. And they've done that in a number of ways. One uh, is that, as I mentioned, and I will keep mentioning, they're not too worried about the risk of going out in a small boat in the ocean without great seafaring <coughs> skills. But they've also been adapted. They've captured now uh, fishing vessels or, or trading dows, some evidence that sometimes they even rent these um, from Yemeni fishing men, uh, fishermen. And, and that gives them a much greater range. So the small plastic skiffs that they use that you've probably seen uh, on television or in the newspapers, those obviously have a limited range. But if you're in a fishing trawler, you can go right the way out uh, towards the Maldives and towards India. So they've been able to do that to increase their range. Uh, they stock up. They take huge supplies uh, of petrol and water and food, allowing them to stay at sea now for months if necessary. And if you ever chart or ever map uh, where pirate attacks have, you'll often see a sort of crescent shape. And essentially this is because there's a pirate a mothership, a, a dhow or a fishing vessel, and they're launching attacks, and they keep launching attacks until they have a successful one. Once they've got a successful one, they can go back to Somalia and begin the ransom negotiation. But I think if we're thinking about how you deal with this, perhaps this points that actually a naval response to piracy is going to run into some very serious problems dealing with what is a very slippery um, operation to deal with. The other element in sort of the broad picture of what's happening to piracy is the cost of piracy. So as I mentioned before, if you go back to the, the mid-2000s, you're looking at tens of thousands of dollars uh, to pay for a ransom to have a ship released. That's rising to sort of 200, 400,000 by 2007, 2008. The estimates for the last year, and again, these are even less accurate than the number of attacks because they're obviously commercially sensitive for shipping companies, you're looking at a, a, an average ransom close to five million US dollars for each successful attack. And that means two things. One, it's obviously costing us a, a much greater deal and more likely to have some kind of knock-on uh, impact in terms of, uh, of the economy. But also it means that for all the success of naval operations, and some of them have been very successful, piracy is a more profitable enterprise in the last year than it was the year before. And the trend seems to be upwards for ransom payments. Uh, the highest payment so far is about $9.5 million paid uh, for the release of the Semhao Dream, a Korean vessel. So there is a, uh, an upward trajectory in terms of ransom payments. And that means that the motivation for getting involved in piracy, whether you're a financier of piracy attacks or just an ordinary foot soldier or foot sailor of piracy, uh, remains incredibly strong. The other thing, just to, to mention in cost, and, and these are very, very difficult numbers to, to estimate accurately, but for a five million ransom, you're looking at least probably another five million dollars in terms of associated costs, in terms of your lawyer's fees, uh, in terms of your increased insurance fees, in terms of compensation to staff, in terms of missed deadlines for the delivery of your goods and, and, and so on. So the, the overall cost uh, of ransoms is probably something in the region of 200-ish uh, million dollars, highly accurate, the ish, uh, but you can double that, treble that, quadruple that even uh, to look at the cost for industry as a whole. And if you add into that uh, things which are much harder to quantify, like, for example, uh, you know, delays in delivery and uh, changing, um, uh, changing employment uh, patterns for seafarers and so on, some estimates, uh, although I think they're, they're slightly overblown, but some estimates put the annual cost of piracy at seven to 12 billion US dollars for the global economy, uh, which is not insignificant at all. So this is a, a growing problem. And then just to map out very briefly what the response has been so far to the problem of Somali piracy. And we can split that into three areas, the naval, the legal, and then the military and political. Uh, in naval terms, 
there has been uh, some good successes. So in 2008, 2009, piracy was mainly concentrated in the Gulf of Aden. And what the navies did, they established a transit corridor, which they patrol. Uh, not, it's not a, uh, a convoy system, but there are naval ships patrolling different areas along there. And they've really been very successful at cutting down attacks in the Gulf of Aden. So that is actually now a relatively safe uh, uh, seaway for, for ships to pass through. In the Indian Ocean, the wider Indian Ocean, obviously, it's much, much harder to set up that kind of zoned patrol, the, that kind of close protection. And you're seeing a much more random, uh, or, sorry, not random, that's unfair on the navies, uh, but they are having to respond to situations as they occur. They're not able to anticipate in quite the same way that they are in the Gulf of Aden. There are some things which navies have been able to do to deal with these uh, wider problems. One is over the last year, NATO, uh, and the EU have been doing some close work on the beaches in Somalia. So identifying places where pirates have stashes of boats and stashes of fuel uh, and putting a, a naval vessel just over the horizon so that when those ships or those boats uh, leave the coast, they're able to pick them up immediately and either arrest the pirates or often uh, just take their guns and send them back to the coast. And that disrupts and has disrupted quite effectively um, a lot of pirate operations. The problem is once they get through that, if they can break that cordon, and there is a limited uh, uh, you know, capacity for the Navy to, uh, to blockade the coast of Somalia, then it's very hard to find them. It is literally uh, looking for a needle in a haystack. And there's a nice example which uh, a former commander of the EU Naval Force uses to explain the difficulty of patrolling this huge area. It's a bit like uh, having your wallet stolen in Sweden and calling a policeman in Spain uh, to come and help you. It's very unlikely he's going to be able to get there in time to help you. So, and I think that's, that really uh, shows, you know, this is an enormous area, much bigger uh, than Western Europe. So those are some of the, the things that they've been doing. There has been a, a really a proliferation of international efforts to deal with this from a naval perspective. Of course, NATO uh, have been involved in this. There's the European Union's uh, first naval mission, EU NAV4, Operation at Atlanta. Um, there is a United States-led uh, coalition, uh, CTF-151, part of the coalition of the willing, the, the war in Afghanistan and in Iraq, uh, which has been sort of cipher, um, uh, diverted to, to deal with the problem of piracy. But you also see actors from China, from India, uh, from Malaysia, from Korea, from Pakistan, uh, getting involved in anti-piracy patrols. And what's one of the perhaps unintended consequences of piracy has forced these very diverse nations and organizations to work together in a way that they don't really do, militarily at least, uh, in other areas of the world. So if nothing else, that's perhaps a useful thing uh, for the world that these people have worked together and there may be some, some positives from that. But it's a very expensive way uh, of doing that. So that's the naval response. And as we've seen in some areas, like the Gulf of Aden, it's been quite successful. At times, it's been quite good in the wider Indian Ocean. But the reality is this is not something, this is not a nut you can crack uh, with a warship. Also, navies are, are built for fighting wars, not for what is essentially police work. The legal response to Somali piracy, and this is again is something which you may have read about and has been quite controversial, often navies have a problem when they find pirates and, and pick them up. They can arrest them but often they can't hold them for very long because nobody wants to receive them. So if a British uh, warship arrests pirates, the British government is completely uninterested in repatriating those pirates to the United Kingdom in order to stand trial in the UK for many reasons. Uh, the cost of it, the worry of once they've served prison sentences for five, ten years, uh, that you then can't send them back to Somalia because of obviously the human rights situation there, and then worries about asylum seeking and so on. So the only time actually that uh, Western countries have tended to take pirates home is when their own citizens have been directly involved. So when uh, some Americans were killed, the US have taken pirates back to America to stand trial. The same has happened in France, in Germany, and in Holland. Um, there are a few pirates, but it's really just a handful. What's tended to happen has been the more preferred choice has been to hand those pirates over to Kenya or to the Seychelles in order that they can stand trial there. Again, there's a problem with that. There's only so much space in Kenyan prisons. Um, and there's actually a very good case to say, why should Kenya uh, have to take responsibility for 
uh, incarcerating all of these pirates. So most pirates actually are picked up, their guns are taken away and they're released. But there are over a thousand, there's over a thousand pirates either in prison or awaiting trial at the moment. So quite a lot of pirates have been taken out of the system. And if you bear in mind that there were probably something in the region of 3,000 active pirates at any one time, that's significant. But remember, this has had really negligible impact on pirate attacks. So I would argue that this legal response, although important because crime shouldn't go unpunished, is not probably uh, the answer to this. Then the military and political side of this. And I, I'm just going to take one step back here um, to talk about Somalia more generally before I get into the military and political side. Because one of the arguments I've always tried to make is that you cannot look at piracy in isolation from the political situation in Somalia. This is a problem of Somalia. This is a problem of state collapse. It's not just uh, a problem of piracy. So in Somalia, very, very briefly, you have uh, four main areas or four Somali actors. In the northwest, you have Somaliland, uh, which is the, uh, uh, former, the former British protectorate of Somaliland, which declared independence in 1991. It remains unrecognized, but this is, I think it's fair to say, the most uh, successful part of Somalia and actually uh, held a very successful uh, democratic election last year with the transfer of power from one party to another. Um, something that some of its neighbours, uh, not just in Somalia, but in the wider East Africa, has have, have had trouble doing uh, in the last few years. So really a success story and quite an achievement. In the northeast, the area where most of the pirates come from, you have a, a slightly different situation of an area called Puntland. Uh, this is relatively successful in terms of security and its economy and so on, but it is not uh, as, as in control of its territory, as in control of what goes on as it as, as Somaliland is. And Puntland actually operates, offers a, a perfect environment for piracy. It's stable enough to keep the endemic violence of southern Somalia out, so you're not having to operate a business in an environment where there's constantly changing uh, control of territory and constantly fighting going on. But it's not quite a strong enough government to be able to take on um, uh, organized criminals. So Puntland is a, is a nice environment for, for criminals to operate in. And then in the sort of southern half of Somalia, you have a number of international actors, I'll come to in a moment, but you have Al-Shabaab, who is a uh, sometimes Al-Qaeda-affiliated or characterized as an Al-Qaeda-affiliated organization, uh, characterized as terrorists by, by many governments, um, that controls the majority of, of southern Somalia. You have a transitional federal government, which is internationally recognized, internationally supported and paid for, that... Um, by the grace of an African Union uh, peacekeeping force, controls most of Mogadishu, but not much of the rest of the country, and is engaged in, um, well, engaged in a lot of infighting and bickering. International support to Somalia and focus has primarily been on bolstering that transitional federal government, on the entity of central government. It's a process that was designed abroad. Uh, the charter for the TFG was written in Nairobi, um, in 2004, with huge support from external donors and supporters. Uh, it took uh, Somali politicians out of Somalia and designed a process there. And this is the difference, perhaps, from Somaliland and from Puntland. Somaliland and Puntland were designed by Somalis in Somalia in response to the situations that they saw around them. And those have been relatively successful. But a number of uh, internationally sanctioned processes over the last 20 years designed outside Somalia have really achieved very little in terms of helping to build stability uh, in Somalia more broadly. And perhaps there's a lesson there as we look to the future, um, you know, future involvement of international uh, uh, actors in Somalia. We can draw some conclusions from that. In terms of military support, military support has, there is some subtle military support from the United States and others to security forces in Puntland and in Somaliland. But the most support has gone towards the African Union mission uh, in, um, in, 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 in Mogadishu. Uh, there's a lot of EU money that goes to them to help them to do their work. There's Ugandan and Burundian troops there. And they've been relatively successful in terms of securing Mogadishu. But the wider program of building stability in Somalia is still elusive. There is an EU training mission for transitional federal government troops. That's based in Uganda. Um, I think there may even, correct me, there may have been some Irish involvement in that. Yeah, Irish under that. 
Um, and that's, uh, well, it certainly had some teething problems at the beginning. I think there were a lot of reports of troops that had been trained in Uganda going back to Mogadishu, selling their weapons or defecting uh, to, uh, to people who would pay them more regularly uh, than the transitional federal government, although I understand that situation has improved recently. But again, this shows the problems of providing a military force for a government that doesn't control a country and that doesn't have popular legitimacy. It's very hard to see um, how that might work out. There are, of course, some drone strikes and some uh, uh, special forces operations as well. Politically, there is uh, one solution that is accepted by the international community, and that's the, the, the success of the transitional federal government. And I think it's interesting when we look to Afghanistan for a moment, where there are beginning to be a softening of the idea of engaging with the Taliban, engaging with uh, various actors in Afghanistan, that in Somalia the position is still very much against any kind of broader engagement. And I think the reality in Somalia is that there isn't uh, the level of support um, for external interventions, external meddling that you see in a country like Afghanistan, yet there is also an insistence that the solution must be a solution that we are comfortable with. And there are some disparities and contradictions in the international community's approach towards Somalia that don't make sense and that, um, you know, well, either we accept another 20 years of state collapse or perhaps we have to address, you know, with the, the limited engagement that the international community is prepared to make in Somalia, how best can you then end up at a stable country? Because bear in mind, we have problems with piracy Somalis have problems uh, far greater than that. They have problems of, of roadblocks, of famine, of, uh, of really, really terrible um, infant mortality, terrible uh, life expectancy. So th this is a, a big problem. So why do these uh, political problems I've been talking about, why do they matter for piracy? Well, I think it, it's quite clear that actually without a functioning government, uh, it's very hard to stop piracy. You look at Somaliland, has no problem with piracy. And that's a functioning government. That's what you want for the rest of Somalia. But the tendency to treat piracy as one problem and as a problem that can be solved by military means and these political problems on the other side that can be solved in a different way has meant that actually we're not making as much headway on piracy and the other problems of Somalia as we could have done. I would have argued that actually piracy was a good way to engage with Western governments to show them and demonstrate the importance of a sustainable political solution to the problem uh, of Somalia, that actually these political problems in Somalia and these humanitarian problems in Somalia obviously have a huge impact for Somalis, but actually also have an impact for us here in the West. So there is, is a problem there. Increasingly, the rhetoric out of Western governments, including in London, has been about a military solution, a security solution for the situation in Somalia, and that includes for the political situation. The increased use of drone attacks uh, talk about uh, sending, uh, well, giving more uh, military capacity to Amazon, talk about uh, helicopter attacks on pirate bases and so on. All of these may have a role to play, let us be frank, in the solution for Somalia. But they tend to continue to make this a problem which we think we can solve through force of arms and through weaponry. Actually, if you look at why people are engaged in piracy for a moment, you can make $10,000 as a pirate at the, at the most basic level, at the lowest level, for one successful hijacking. If you do three of those in a year, you're doing very, very well by any standards anywhere in the world. You put in mind that the sort of estimate for Somali GDP per head is about $600 per year, and for many people will be much, much lower than that. And the economic incentive is absolutely clear. Piracy is the best career uh, you can have uh, for a young man in Somalia. Even uh, for, uh, being in the transitional federal government uh, military forces, you get paid, I think, $100 a month. So, you know, it's very clear where the, where the money is. Look at Puntland, the government of Puntland. They have an annual budget of about 19 to 20 uh, million US dollars. If pirates pull in a conservative, let's be conservative, let's say pirates pull in 80 million US dollars a year, clearly the government is then having to take on a very, very significant economic interest uh, in its own area. And so what is the advantage for Puntland in taking on pirates? Most likely if they take on pirates without adequate support, without adequate um, backing, they are going to find people funding opposition groups, funding other armed groups in Somalia. So there's a real danger there. Also, if you look at Puntland just for a moment, 
a very interesting paper that Chasma has brought out uh, very recently it uses satellite imagery and uh, tracking of food prices and so on to demonstrate that there is a clear, more broad economic uh, impact for people in northeastern Somalia, a positive economic impact of piracy, which is not seen in the rest of the country. So again, for a government like Puntland, what is in it for them to tackle piracy? And that is why I think if we want to approach this issue of piracy, we need to do it two things. One is to consider it in the broader situation of Somali politics and the politics of Somalia. And secondly, we need approaches to dealing with piracy which are not purely military. Uh, we need to look at how do you make it less attractive to take the risk of going out in a small boat in the ocean and maybe getting shot by uh, the Navy um, than staying at home in your job. At the moment, if it's $600 at home versus $10,000 on the ocean, it's very clear which choice people will make. If, however, careful investment and large-scale investment, uh, or is actually, um, some people have argued, just paying people, um, to stay at home uh, makes a much more attractive solution and a more cost-effective solution uh, for the rest of us around the world. It's not impossible to stop piracy. There's a small town called Ale, which used to be the hotbed uh, of, of pirate launches, but it's where the president of Puntland came from. Uh, and when he became president, it was very embarrassing for him. So he was able to put on a lot of pressure on the community in that area, use his security forces, and stop piracy from there. Of course, it didn't stop piracy at all. It just displaced it to other areas. But if you keep displacing them, obviously, it becomes more difficult for them. So I would argue that although there have been some very significant successes for the naval approach to piracy, we need something broader than just a security response. And that's important, because you need political space for Somali actors to engage with this. You need flexibility in what that solution is going to, be look, going to look like. And I would argue for Somalia's neighbours, for Somalia's partners around the world, uh, we shouldn't be too prescriptive about the kind of government, or perhaps more realistically, the kind of governments that emerge in Somalia. It's better to have governments that you don't necessarily agree with, but that are, in fact, actually governments um, who can actually do things, than have what we have at the moment, which is a government which agrees with everything uh, that we say and does, says it will do exactly what we want it to do, but in reality um, is unable to do very much. Um, so we talk about a land-based solution to Somali piracy, and that's the, the buzzword at the moment uh, in the run-up to this conference in London that's happening in February on, uh, on Somalia. It's all about land-based solutions, land-based solutions. Uh, but those land-based solutions, I would argue quite strongly, need to not be the kind of land-based solutions which involve militaries, but land-based solutions that involve development, that involve political engagement, and that involve um, a sort of longer-term uh, solution to the Somali crisis. Thank, Thank you. you very much indeed, Robert. <laughs>